السلام علیکم امید ہے کہ آپ سب خوش ہوں گے آج میں آپ کو برمنگم کنال کی سیر کرواؤں گا چلیں اسٹارٹ کریں یہ جو آپ سامنے بلڈنگ دیکھ رہے ہیں یہ کیوب بلڈنگ ہے اس میں ریزیڈینشیل اپارٹمنٹ بنے ہوئے ہیں اور اس کے ٹاپ فلور کے اوپر ایک ریسٹورینٹ اور بار بنا ہوا ہے یہ جو سامنے ایل سی ڈی لگی ہوئی ہے یہاں پہ انہوں نے کامن ویلتھ گیم کا ڈسپلے کیا ہوا ہے یہاں پہ ایک بڑا خوبصورت سا یہ اے سی ہوٹل برمنگم ہے کنال ویو کے اوپر ساتھ اس کے ریسٹورینٹ اور بار بنے ہوئے ہیں اور یہ جو ایریا انہوں نے سٹی کے لیے بنایا ہوا ہے جو سامنے آپ جو کنال دیکھ رہے ہیں اس کا جو واٹر کا لیول ہے یہ خود مینٹین کرتے ہیں اور اس کے لیے ایک این جی او بنی ہوئی ہے جو اس کی ساری مینٹیننس کرتی ہے یہ کیوب بلڈنگ کی انٹرنس ہے یہ برمنگم کا لو برج ہے یہاں لوگ آ کے اپنے پیار کے جو تارے لگا جاتے ہیں یہاں کے لوگ ان چیزوں میں بڑا یقین کرتے ہیں یہ آپ دیکھ سکتے ہیں دونوں سائڈوں کے اوپر یہ آپ دیکھ سکتے ہیں کافی پرانے تالے لگے ہوئے ہیں یہاں پہ جس طرح ان تالوں کو زنگ لگ گیا ہے پیار کو بھی تھوڑی دیر بعد اس طرح زنگ لگنا شروع ہو جاتا ہے یہ جو آپ سامنے بورڈ دیکھ رہے ہیں کچھ لوگوں نے اپنے یہ رہنے کے لیے رکھی ہیں اور جو لوگ ریٹائر ہو جاتے ہیں تو وہ ایک آدھی بورڈ تیار کروا کے تو پھر اس کے اندر رہنا شروع کر دیتے ہیں تو اس کے اندر لیونگ ایکسپینس ان کا بڑا کم ہو جاتا ہے صرف کھانے کا ہی خرچہ رہ جاتا ہے تو یہ آپ کیوب کا دیکھ سکتے ہیں باہر سے بڑی ہی خوبصورت بلڈنگ آئی سارا اندر سسٹم کیا ہوا ہے بیڈ کچن ہر چیز رہنے کے قابل بنائی ہوئی ہے یہ پورا کسی نے انتظام کیا ہوا ہے لوگ یہاں سے پھر آ کے پیچھے بھی چلے جاتے ہیں سائیکل لکڑی وغیرہ ساری جنریٹر پڑا ہوا ہے آپ دیکھ سکتے ہیں سامنے بسکیں بڑا انجوائے کر رہی ہیں تو یہ ایسے ہی انہوں نے یہاں پہ آزاد چھوڑی ہیں خوبصورتی کے لیے یہ جو آپ سامنے بلڈنگ دیکھ رہے ہیں یہ پاکستان امبیسی کی بلڈنگ ہے تو بڑے انہوں نے اچھے ویو کے اوپر یہ بلڈنگ اپنا آفس بنایا ہوگا اور اس کے علاوہ کنال سائٹ کے اوپر بڑے خوبصورت سے ریسٹورنٹ اور بار بنے ہوئے ہیں کافی ٹرڈیشنل سٹائل کے ہیں پرانے
ये जो कनाल है ये तकरीबन सत्रह सौ बोर्ड का टूर है वो तकरीबन ये करवाते हैं डेढ़ घंटे का होता है डल्ट का सिक्स पाउंड चार्ज करते हैं और चाइल्ड का करते हैं फोर पाउंड चार्ज इसकी जो गहराई है वो फोर एंड हाफ फिट है साढ़े चार फिट Good morning, everybody. Welcome aboard. We're fully qualified and trained boatmaster with the maritime and as we can possibly be, we are governed and licensed by the Coast Guard. They inspect our boat very regularly. At least every 12 months, they will inspect us out of the water. Every six months, they will come and make sure that we are doing our job correctly, keeping you guys safe, and of course, that we are carrying our requisite safety equipment. Ten life rings on the roof of the boat on the outside. We've got safety ladders and throw lines on board the vessel if they're needed. And on the off chance that eighteen and a half tons of steel floating on three million gallons of water does decide to spontaneously combust, we do carry fire extinguishers and we are trained in their use. We also carry first aid kits. So if there is an emergency, please remain calm. Please remain seated. I will issue further instructions. Those instructions they tend to be. This canal is only four and a half foot deep. Stand on the seats. You won't even get your feet wet should the worst actually happen. We will keep you nice and safe on this trip, don't we, woman? Now the next thing we're going to do on this trip is confuse you all. Because we've been travelling for less than a minute in this direction. We're just about to turn our boat around and we are going to head out in the opposite direction. We actually do this for a very good reason, though. We are turning up just the other side of this tunnel in Gas Street Basin. And Gas Street Basin is the site of the. That's all right. Uh, right. One of the issues being uh, qualified by the Maritime and Coast Guard agencies, we are legally obliged to use our horn signals. And uh, this boat. I don't think you those horn signals. I'm just going to come to the front of the boat, start swinging off, have it to actually spin the boat where we need to do so now. Well, oh, then I'm going to leave you with it and see what happens. You do this every day? No, it's just because, yeah. We gave the horn signal to say we were turning boats. In the morning. As I said, we give the official horn signals, but probably. It's not a legal obligation for the private boaters to actually know what those horn signals are, um, so it is a little weird. So the history of Gas Street Basin itself, well we probably just saw there was a very narrow section just behind me where that boat did come out of. And if we were to travel through that narrow section it takes us on to an entirely different canal. We are currently on the Birmingham Canal Navigations. Through that narrow section is the Worcester and Birmingham Canal. This is a competing canal by a competing company. Birmingham Canals have got here first and then... Birmingham Canal to E. The unloading process took place across what is known as the Worcester Bar. The Worcester Bar being the six foot three section of land that those boats behind us are reverse moored onto. 
This situation lasted for 20 years until the two companies reached an agreement. The agreement was the Worcester and Birmingham Canal would raise the height of their water by six inches. They also agreed to pay compensation toll to the Birmingham Canals for any boat that came through. But eventually in 1815 they did make that physical connection and it was made in the form of the Worcester Bar Stock Lock. That's why that section is so narrow, it was a tunnel that we have just travelled through. You see Broad Street Tunnel we have just travelled through actually a shorter tunnel than one of the road bridges we will be travelling underneath on this very is it, is it used to be longer it used to support St Margaret's Church built over the canal and when the church was followed, they simply retained the name of the tunnel these days the bridge itself is now going with the famous Birmingham metal band by that name were given their own star on the holly on the broad street walk of fame the bridge was renamed in honor of the band and they also installed a bench on the bridge you can sit on that bench and you can pretend you are having your photos taken with all four members of the band on the region as a whole well that first question why are the canals here that is actually a remarkable question to answer canals are here the efficiency of transportation because previous to the boats coming into Birmingham everything was brought in by horse and cart they would load a ton up to a maximum of a ton and a half of materials onto one of the carts they're then dragging that cart all the way into the city along those dirty dusty and rutted old cart tracks using a single horse and a single driver Transfer onto these boats and we can now load these with 30 or even 40 tonnes of fuel away up into the city using that same single horse and the driver. So looking at it purely from a financial point of view. Bring the material in by boats, we're paying one man's wage, we're paying to stable and feed a single horse. To bring that same quantity material in by horse and cart, we'd be paying 30 men's wages, we would be paying to stable and feed 30 horses. Now the next question I posed, how did the canals get here? That is a bit more complicated. As much money as possible. The Act of Parliament for the Birmingham Canal Navigations was written into law in 1767. So we truly are travelling through more than 250 a year's worth of history on this trip. The Birmingham Canal Navigation Company had been formed by a group of coal mine owners and those coal mine owners were predominantly from the Black Country region. Not only did they want to get their coal into the city in the most efficient manner, but they had also seen the commercial success of the Bridgewater Canal up in Manchester. They wanted some of that commercial success for the animals, so they approached the same where the Sea Life Centre and our mooring is. Both named after the guy that built the Sea Canal. James Windley surveyed, proposed and built this first canal that we are currently travelling along. And this canal is what is known as, as a contour canal. It follows the contour lines of our land. Same thing that we see on the Ordnance Survey map. Contour line is height above sea level. James Brindley chose the 453 foot level to bring this canal into Birmingham and he chose a contour canal because they're easy and simple canals to build. We don't need deep cuttings, we don't need tall embankments. We a cheaper canal to build but they do leave us with a very long and circuitous route. Oh, we wend our way around the canal system in canal terminology. It took two years to connect this because the day this canal opened, the price of coal plummets. The end user is now paying half the amount that they were the day previous. Not only is the end user paying half the amount, but those mine owners, they are making more money per tonne at the same time, such as an increase in the efficiency of transport we're now able to use. So we've now got ourselves a cheap and a plentiful supply of coal, but and these boats also give us access to a high quality seam of limestone and iron ore that is once again predominantly over in the black country. In fact to this very day 
you can still take these boats directly into those limestone mines and iron ore cabinets. The iron ore, the limestone and the coal, these are the three key ingredients in the production of iron in those early years. So we can truly say that these boats and these canals help to kickstart uh, hands in So these are the three key materials in the production of iron. So we can truly really see coal in such close proximity and we end up with a heavy ball of pollution. And this pollution is sitting all over the region as smog. This smog restricted the daylight that was able to reach us. Black, high, dark. And by night, well those coal fires, those lime kilns, those smelting pots, these are all operating 24 hours a day, seven days of the week. This would cause the horizon around the region to glow red in the evenings and through the night. Red by night. This pollution also led to quite a little cool evolutionary twist as well. As a moth in this country, it is called pepper moth. The pepper moth resides predominantly on the silver birch tree. Because of the pollution in this region, our silver birch trees are no longer silver. They've got a layer of soot on them. The peppered moth changed its colours to match. The peppered moth changed from being a white moth with black speckles. And it's a black moth with white speckles. But our industry has now evolved a regional subspecies of moth. And we've changed it to its original colourations as well. This section of the original canal travelling through the mountains. This area is officially known as the Oozle Street Loop. It is more commonly referred to these days, however, as Sherbal Wharf. The section we've just been through, you guys are actually quite privileged to see. There is no public towpath around the corner that we've just come around. Only way you get to see that is from one of these boats, or of course, if you happen to live in one of these flats or boats moored in the centre. As we can see, it is completely surrounded by those residential accommodation, all those flats these days, completely surrounding the basin. And we've got some boats moored up in the centre of the area. 250 years ago, this was a very different place. It was 250 years ago. These for residential accommodation, this would have all been warehouses or factories. And these boats moored in the centre, they would not have been cabin boats. They would have all been full length 70 foot boats with eight cabins. They were built purely for the transportation of materials. And each one of these factories or warehouses would have had a crane coming out of the very top floor. And they would generally unload every single boat all the way up to the very top of the building. It makes more sense to do so when you think about it. Use the mechanical lift to get those goods all the way up to the very top. Then you can bring those items down floor by floor to where they are needed. It is much easier than trying to unload at the level of the canal and then carry everything up to where it's needed anyway. And very shortly you're going to see me come walking up towards the front of the boat for the second time, it's normally the first time in the trip. And more important job than what I was just at when I was in Gas Street Basin. I was helping to get the front of the boat moving to go to swear in the court. On this occasion, I'm going to be taking up position on those right hand set of steps at the very front. You see, Axel is driving us today. He is driving from the very back of a 70 foot long boat. Axel can't see around corners. So I'm just coming up to the front and I am going to act as Axel's eyes and ears from the very front of the boat. So as I say, I'll be putting the microphone down and walking up the centre of the boat very shortly.
feel probably now because as we come out of here that we are taking up position on the right hand side because we do drive on the opposite side of the canal water to what we do on our roads. And as we head into this bridge hole, have a good look at the sandstone supports on the very corner of the brick. The very corner of the bridge. You will see some deep grooves that have been cut into that sandstone block. Those grooves have been caused by hundreds upon hundreds of horses. Boats on the very front of the boat. You will see the original heavy duty coping stones on our right hand side come to an end. They'll first of all get replaced by a layer of concrete. And as we clear these boats we will see that we will then find ourselves on a brick lined section of the canal. So at this point of the trip I always make the same recommendation. Not just when you're on this boat, do the same when you are walking the towpaths. Pay attention to changes such as these. And if you see something change, if you see something strange or unusual, you will always be able to dig down and discover the history behind it. That layer of concrete is actually the original line of this canal. It used to come out of the usual street loop, the same as we've just done in the late 1980s. That was to follow that 453 foot level. The brick line section of the canal that we're on at the moment, this is the new mainline canal because we do indeed have two main lines in our city. How did we end up with two canals? But essentially that's 17 by James Brindley, that canal became a victim of its own success. The canal kick-started the industrial revolution, got very busy very quickly. The canal got congested, the boats holding each other up. By 1820 this was a serious and significant issue. So serious that the Birmingham Canals decided to approach a very famous engineer from this country. Sure you have heard of him on this boat. It's an engineer by the name of Sir Thomas Telford. One of this country's most prolific engineers. And Thomas Telford came up with a number of ideas to improve this canal. First of all, we are significantly wider than the original canals. Nearly 80 feet wide on certain sections. Widening the canal does not mean that we've got more... It's important because any boat coming into or leaving Birmingham is using a lock to get there. And each use of a lock draws water down off the Birmingham level. To increase the width of the canal and increase how much water is actually available, we can reduce the impact of each use of one of those locks. In other words, what Thomas Telford is doing, he is using this canal as a reservoir for itself. And quite clever, quite an ingenious idea. The next thing that Thomas could do, previous to this, like the majority of canals in this country, the Birmingham canals had only got a single towpath. That's absolutely fine until you meet a boat coming in the opposite direction. And as we come past Monument Road Basin, we come past the bridge, have a good look at this cast iron bridge, and in particular the handrail closest to us. We will see similar damage done to that cast iron handrail that was done to that sandstone blocks, once again caused by those ropes. And talking of ropes, that's what made passing boats on a single towpath difficult. Because as soon as we meet a boat in the opposite direction, at a minimum we need to be slackening the rope between the horse and the boat. That's if we don't untie that horse completely. We then need to manhandle that horse either over or underneath the boat that we are passing. We're losing time, we're losing energy. Costing us money. And it certainly wasn't unknown in those early days of boating for those working boatmen to end up having physical fist fights over who's turning right and all those roads. Introduce a towpath onto either side, and we can also introduce a rule. And that rule is that we will always have our horse on our right hand side. That means any boat that we are passing, their horse is walking towards us on our left hand side. We've no longer got the crossing. The next thing Thomas Telford does is take advantage. And he is taking advantage of the advancements that we've made in our engineering capability. 
as those intermediary 50 years have brought us an awful long way but we can now dig the dead cuttings we can also build those get the navvies to start digging there first and they would dig down until they've reached that 453 foot level before filling the canal with water they would then pull a boat up the canal and fill that boat with the spoil they've been leaving to either side and they can then drop around using the James Brindley contour to where they need an embankment building and simply empty the boat and build an embankment well we can now compare the two canals because we've just got that James Brindley line going off on our left hand side compare that twisty narrow canal by looking down the line of the boat and we can see that we are now on an orb. As we've dug these cuttings, we've built these embankments and we have straightened the canal out as much as humanly possible. From this point on the Thomas Telford improvements to a flight of locks known as the factory locks in Tipton, we have got our journey distance to the same point. Our journey would actually be some 18 miles long. We've reduced the journey to be travelled by 10 miles. Our maximum speed on these canals is somewhere in the region of 4 miles an hour. So we can do the maths. And if we reduce the distance by 10 miles travelling at 4 miles an hour, we are saving a massive two and a half hours off each and every single journey that we are making. Significant savings in time and energy. Now let's not forget this is a business. Most importantly, significant savings in the world to the staff members. Most importantly, we are going to be making the left hand turn. We're going to be picking up the James Brindley Contour Canal and coming back on ourselves. Up near the front of the boat again for this one, because as you will see, we are going to take up the entirety of both canals to the corner safe. And as we do so, we will be travelling underneath the cast iron bridge on our left really quite slowly. Have a good look at this bridge. This is the original bridge built. This bridge was built. This bridge was cast by Thomas Asprey and Smethwick and it was installed in 1854. The only maintenance it's ever needed. Quick sand down and lick of black and white paint every couple of years. Remarkable condition. Also, something very strange will happen to the towpath around about 80 feet around the corner on our left hand side. Pay attention to what happens to the towpath and not pay the significance when I get back very shortly. As we come around the corner, did everybody spot that the towpath actually gets blocked by a brick wall? And the towpath gets blocked by a brick wall because the Ignil Port Loop we have just turned into is even more unusual than our main line in the city. That line's unusual because it's got twin towpaths. This section of Birmingham's canals has had no towpath at all for over 100 years. The reason being this section of Birmingham used to be completely filled in with industry. And when the age of the horse-drawn boats came to an end, replaced first by steam, followed by the diesel engines we use today, the industry around this area, they no longer needed those towpaths. All they needed was those loading wharfs, somewhere to get that boat tied up, get it unloaded and reloaded once more. As we can see, this is about to change, because we are going to get public access into this section of Birmingham for the first time in all those years because we are currently smack bang in the centre of the Ignealed Port Master Plan 
This is Birmingham's largest regeneration zone. We are looking into the Ignils Port Loop development. This is being advertised as Birmingham's only residential island development. And it is indeed a true island. It is an island that is a bit of a stalemate at phase three at the moment as well. Because the buildings themselves, they are modular by design. They're being built in a factory in Manchester, brought into Birmingham on the back of a lorry where their external cladding gets put into place. Unfortunately, the company building those houses in that factory, that company went into administration some six weeks ago. What are you, have we got a heaven up there? Oh yeah, heaven just up on the wall, behind us as we come through. I knew you lot must have been pointing at some <laughs> six weeks ago the houses the building work has come to a complete standstill since that time and as we now bring ourselves towards the Ignil Port Road Bridge for the first time we'll be heading through the bridge hole and you can look forward and you can already see the next of Thomas Telford's improvements coming into view because as well as using the canal as a reservoir for itself Sir Telford did build true reservoirs and that grass bank that we can see starting to climb up in front of us, that grass bank is the Urban Dam of Edgebaston Reservoir. This was originally built as Rotten Park Reservoir, an extension of Roach Pool in those deer hunting grounds. Nothing left of those deer hunting grounds anymore. It is simply known as Edgebaston Res to this day. And it is still doing the job it was originally designed for. It is still feeding the Birmingham canals with water. And it's feeding down that brick slope that is just coming into view on our foot right and side. Quite a heavy feed on today. That water is actually topping up the Birmingham level, making sure that we've got enough water in here to navigate with. Right, and it would have been their job to manually monitor the water levels of the Birmingham canals and open and close those manual feeds to the reservoir as and when required. These days, the water monitoring is actually done automatically using an electronic system known as SCADA. But believe it or not, those feeds are still the original hand and hand run hand ground sluices that were originally built. But the person who would have been living on site, who would have been living in this beautiful, very characterful little cottage on our right hand side, until we come past it, you can't really see the character. But as we start to come past, if we look over our shoulders, you will see that that building has got a load of character, beautiful arched windows. This is one of the original Birmingham Canal Navigation cottages. These were colloquially known as the BCN Cottage, and there were originally 172 built. Unfortunately, we've only got about 60 remaining. The majority of them were no longer habitable, the only reason why this particular cottage survived is because that cottage was converted into an office and that was converted into an office for what is still the working waterways yard just here on our right hand side. So we're just coming past some of the more modern era working boats, we then come past some of the old historic fleets. The Nansen 2, the boat closest to us, that is an icebreaker. And as we come past we've got a tug and flat and a couple of beautiful old working boats on the far side. Scorpio is a diesel engine boat. The boat on the extreme far side is a boat named Leo, and Leo is a butty boat. Butty boat is a boat without its own engine. And for that reason, Leo and Scorpio combined, because Leo can only ever work when paired with its motor, Leo and Scorpio are what is known as an old working pair. killer of our historic brickwork in this country. The vegetation that we can see growing out of our walls to our left and to our right, this is a plant named Budlia. Beautiful cone-like flower heads on the end, stunning vivid violet and purple colours. Budlia is an absolutely fantastic habitat for butterflies. These bushes will be absolutely teeming with uh, butterflies in just a few days to a few weeks time. 
Unfortunately, as we can also see, Budlia will start growing in the mortar between our brickwork. Budlia is a very fast-growing species. It is also quite a thick and woody growth. And as it does grow and as it expands, it simply starts to crumble the brickwork, eventually popping the brickwork out of the walls. And at that point, it's got the twofold effect. It is ruining, ruining our heritage, and it is also going to start blocking our navigations up from the bottom as the bricks make the bottom get too close to the top, as we would say. Now <laughs> back through the bridge hole of the Ipnil Pool Road, back under the road for the second time. And I'm going to start talking about the gauge of our canals a little bit. Because we are a narrow gauge canal system here in the Midlands. And the reason why we're a narrow gauge system is because of the hill that Birmingham is built on. Because of the hill that we're built on. Meanwhile, yeah, I'm wrong side in his earshot, but I'll come, I'll come back to that very shortly. Basically, as somebody who's the, who's the owner of multiple dogs and who walks them on a very frequent basis, I personally will never, ever, ever eat blackberries that are a dog peeing level. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just a personal thing for myself. But because we are now, because we are on the hilly Birmingham, water preservation was a top priority to those early canal pioneers. For that reason, the seven foot wide lock was created. North and south of Birmingham, we do actually have wide gauge canals, 14 foot wide locks as opposed to our seven. And there was a plan of actually widening the locks through Birmingham at one point in time, removing us as the bottleneck for those wide beam boats. We did start the process, but they ran out of money. Birmingham is still the bottleneck for the wide beam boats, so we shouldn't ever see this boat just here on our left hand side. Because this big green boat is a full 14 foot wide, and this boat caused an awful lot of confusion in the boating community when it first arrived on Birmingham's level. It doesn't fit through our locks. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't even go through most of our bridge holes. It turns out that that boat was craned into the water, and they used that boat as the sails and the marketing suite for the development before they completed the show homes. Now that they have got the show homes complete, that boat has been converted and that boat had been converted into a community centre and coffee shop. And as we came past, you may have noticed that that boat is moored onto a large one-acre communal garden. That is one of three communal gardens due to be built as part of this development. And in those communal gardens, they are hosting free events for the residents. They've had street food events and music events, poetry readings and storytellings. The idea is actively build a community on the island rather than leaving them as an individual selection of houses. It is actually quite a refreshing thing to see. And indeed, if you share the post card with Bot, or in other words, if you live in one of these new houses on the estate, ladies and gentlemen, you get free coffee and cake every Saturday morning inside the boat. As I say, the idea is get the neighbours out of the boat, get them talking to each other, get them communicating build a community of residents rather than individual houses. But very shortly we will be making our final turn back onto the main line canal. We'll be turning right and I'm going to be at the front of the boat once more to make the corner safely. When I get back on the microphone I'm going to talk a little bit about what caused the decline of our canals and I'm going to talk about how we've turned them around and got back to this wonderful, fantastic and precious leisure resource that we have in the modern canal age. I will be back on the microphone very shortly.
As we just finish our turn up onto the mainland canal, we can look out of our left hand windows and we can see the electrified lines of our parallel running railway to our main line canal. And it was indeed the coming of the railway age that started our slow and our gradual decline of our canals all those years ago. The only reason for that decline is once again the efficient to going for the grade of the classification that has been used. If we move from 40 tonnes on a boat at 4 miles an hour, we can load the train with at least 10 times that load, and that train could be moved at least 10 times the speed. We've still only got two members of staff to pay, because we've got the driver and the boilerman on the trains, as opposed to the driver and the horse to stable and feed on these canals. Canals could not compete with the efficiency of the rail. And you may have noticed that it is not just in Birmingham that our canals and railways do run parallel. The same is replicated up and down the country. And the reason is, once again, efficiency. But this time it's the efficiency of the builds. Because we've already got the land level for these canals. We've got the embankments built where they're needed. We've got the cuttings dug where they are required. Widen each of these areas ever so slightly. Lay down your tracks and you've got your train line the quickest and easiest ways to get them built. Once again, it's a business. It's also the cheapest ways to get them built as well. Into this slow, uh, excuse me guys, can you keep it down a little bit? We've got people that are trying to listen here. Or uh, with you guys screaming just in front of me, it's being picked up through the microphone and being transmitted straight down the boat. It's fine having a chat amongst yourself when it starts getting to that volume, that's not fair on everybody else. Here in Birmingham we were actually a little on the lucky side and we were lucky because the Birmingham Canal Navigation Company was a thinking company. They had seen the potential competition from the railways coming and they actually took a large shareholding in the Great Western Railway connection between London and Birmingham. They also built or converted up to 40 interchange basins. And an interchange basin is where you take a spur off the main line canal and also a spur off the main line railway. They would take advantage of the efficiency of rail, load a train and by rail, put it off into one of those interchange basins. And in that interchange basin they would unload the trains and they would load the boats. And our boats in the city continued to make the final mile delivery to the factories. Such as that humpback bridge and the brick to parchway in the centre of that bridge that did used to be a one third of a mile long private factory arm. So the raw materials taken into that factory by boat, finished products back to the boat, taken back to the interchange basins, take advantage of that efficiency for the long haul journey once again. What actually ended our commercial activity here in Birmingham was the improvements to the road haulage industry. At a certain point it became more efficient to make that final mile delivery by lorry than it ever had been by boat. And at that point in time, those private factory arms, they got infills and their boat parking got changed into a lobby parking. And nationwide, the canal seriously suffered. We lost over 50% of our canal navigations nationwide, going from over 4,000 miles to just around 2,000 miles remaining. Being in Birmingham, as I say, we were marginally luckier, although we did still lose 30% of our canals going from 170 miles to just over 110 today. 
1947, the commercial viability of our canals had come to an end and they were taken into government control. They were nationalised with the British Waterways Board being created. The original intention was to slowly close down our non-commercially viable canals. They did start the process. Luckily at this point in time we got a few canal enthusiasts that came onto the scene. One of the better known of which was a gentleman by the name of R.T. Vault. Even better known as Tom Walt. And Tom Walt, upon his retirement from work, had converted an old working navboat named Cressy. And he converted Cressy into what is considered to be one of the first full-time liveaboard boats in the country. He then travelled around as much of the inland waterways as he could. He wrote a book about that journey. And when that book sold, that book was successful. And the most successful thing from that book is that book managed to rekindle the public's imagination. It made us realise just what a fantastic and precious leisure resource the majority of us in this country have got right on our doorsteps. He also started the Inland Waterways Association, or the IWA for short. And the IWA have been fighting against those government-imposed closures ever since. They've held canal cavalcades, boating parades, waterways festivals, floating markets anything they could do to encourage the public's use of these waterways and these towpaths surrounding them. And we are now in a fortunate position because we have not lost a major section of canal in this country in well over a decade. And in fact we are getting canal projects, we are getting canals restored and reopened. Within a 10 mile radius of where we are right now we've got the Lapa restoration, the Litchfield and Hatherton and the Braid restoration. Further afield, as you go down towards London on the Grand Union Canal, you've got the Wendover restoration, reopening that feeder onto the Trig Summit, as I say, on the Grand Union. But very shortly, just on our left-hand side, we are about to come past my favourite building within the city centre. This is a building built in 1874 by the City of Birmingham Corporation. It was stabling on the ground floor with office accommodation and warehousing above. It's just going to come into view on our left hand side as we clear this block of flats. Absolutely stunning construction that has very recently gone through a very expensive restoration. Courtesy of the Heritage Lottery Fund, jointly managed by the co-owners of the building. The National Trust and the Canal and Rivers Trust. And if you do have any spare time while you're here with us in Birmingham, I would highly recommend a wonder around there. They've recently, uh, as I say, recently restored, built a little museum up on the, one on the middle floors, and they've got quite a beautiful little cafe in there as well. The building is called the Roundhouse, although it's actually built in a horseshoe shape. If you go through to the interior of that building, you find yourself in the most stunning, beautiful, circular, cobbled courtyard inside. Definitely recommend half an hour to an hour if you've got any spare time. And I have been led to believe that the restaurant in there is up to a very good standard as well. As I say, when that was originally built, it was stabling on the ground floor. We've actually got a couple of different ways that our stable blocks would be used by the boaters. First of all, we've got those boaters making that final mile delivery, those local boaters. They would stable their horse overnight and they would moor their boat overnight. They would then reattach the same horse to the same boat the following day. We've also got a group of boaters known as the fly boaters. And fly boaters plied their trade almost exclusively between the cities of Birmingham and London. It's a long journey. It's 148 miles from Paddington Basin in London. There is also 166 locks to get up into Birmingham city centre. And the flyboaters made that trip in 72 hours, moving non-stop throughout the day and the night. So they would have to use the stable blocks differently because they would have to switch over their horses and their staff over to fresh lakes. As we wind our way slowly between these moored boats, we are just going to bring ourselves up past the National Indoor Arena. And yes, I am aware that it is no longer officially called the National Indoor Arena, but I'm afraid I've reached the point where I just point blank refuse to keep up with the silly names that keep changing it to. I can't keep up, so that's the NIA, the NEC is the NEC. It's going it's to have to stay that way in my head now. Too long in the tooth to learn anything else. 
But as we are bringing ourselves up past here, we are unfortunately coming towards the end of our trip. I hope you've enjoyed the sights and I hope you've enjoyed the history. And if you are local, I do hope the Amiam accent hasn't grated too much on anybody on the boat. And all the way we speak do get to, does get to some folk. Whether you've enjoyed it or not, we always appreciate feedback, good or bad. We want TripAdvisor, Google and Facebook. Brindley Cruises is our name. Good feedback that makes us feel all warm and fuzzy. Poor feedback will help us grow our business by learning from it. And we are also available for private hire. We can do two, three and four hour parties on this boat. We've got a custom installed sound system. We've got a fully licensed bar. You can party the night away on this boat if you so wish. If you're interested, have a look at our website. That is brindleycruises.co.uk or feel free to come and grab one of our leafly talk business cards off the bar before you leave the boat. I'm talking and leaving the boat. If I could ask everyone to remain seated until we're fully tied up and secure with our steps back on the front. We do sometimes come in hard to the towpath when we pull on our moving lines. I would hate to see anybody getting hurt at this late stage. Most important though, ladies and gentlemen, once again, I would like to thank you for showing. Enjoy the rest of this glorious weather we're being blessed with. Enjoy the rest of the Commonwealth Games and your stay in Birmingham. And please have a safe, a sound and a pleasant onward journey to wherever your day may be taking you next. Thanks again, everybody. All that I really need to say now is, turn on a bit. Have a good one all. ये जो टिकट चार्ज करते हैं वो एडल्ट के लिए है सिक्स पाउंड चिल्ड्रन के लिए है फोर पाउंड और स्टूडेंट के लिए है फाइव पाउंड डिस्काउंट देते हैं वन पाउंड का स्टूडेंट को और इस जो कनाल की गहराई है वो साढ़े चार फिट है आज की वीडियो का यहाँ पे इतना होता है उम्मीद है कि आपको ये वीडियो पसंद आएगी तो आप याद रखिएगा सोचते हैं अपने